Hello, my name is Christy Coleman, and today I'm here with Ron Coleman to ask him a few questions and do a little interview for the Sacramento Aquarium Society. Hi, Ron. Hi, Christy. Sorry we, uh, we couldn't actually be in the lab. Um, the talk is about the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes Lab, but um, because of the virus situation, um, she's not allowed in the lab. So we're going to do this uh, interview here in our backyard and the cats may appear, <laughs> come and go. And uh, then we're going to splice in some footage of um, some of the fish and some of the stuff that's going on in the lab. So Ron, can you tell me how you got started with fish? So um, yeah, how did I get started with fish? It's kind of interesting. Um, I, as a kid, I didn't have any pets, like no cats or dogs. And I, um, I got a fish tank when I was about 10. And I started out with uh, what most people do, uh, a sword tail, um, uh, a little puffer fish. And I quickly learned that you can't keep puffer fish with sword tails. Um, so I, I started out with this, this tank. And uh, then when I uh, went to university, I um, was interested in biology. I took a lot of courses and during that time, I actually was working during the summer and on the weekends at the Vancouver Aquarium, which is a public aquarium up in uh, British Columbia, Canada. And I got more and more interested in fishes the more I worked there because the, the incredible diversity, the, the just all sorts of different colors and sizes and the things that they do, I just found that really, really fascinating. And I actually... Um, at that point, I, I knew I was going to be a biologist, and I thought that I was going to study uh, wildebeest on the Great Plains of Africa. That was one of my goals in life, to study the wildebeest. And then I had a professor, I, uh, Professor Sinclair, who actually did study the wildebeest on the Great Plains of Africa. And he would tell us a little bit what it's like. And it wasn't quite as glamorous as I thought, because um, one of the things about wildebeest is they run away from you and uh, then you have to chase them and then they run away again and then um, he also made us realize that when you have uh, I don't know if you know uh, many of you are perhaps a little familiar with horses if you have one or two horses around a barn you know that they can create quite a bit of uh, dust and mess and, and stuff well just imagine 20,000 horse sized animals all together it's not a pretty sight and it doesn't smell good. So I thought, yeah, um, maybe that's not what I want to do. But then there were these fishes and these fishes, they just kept being more and more kinds. And one of the things I, I learned to uh, appreciate was that you can keep fishes in a tank or you can study them in the wild. Or as I like to do, you can do both. And so um, that's, uh, that's really got me, what got me interested in fishes. Okay, well, can you tell me about the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes lab that you run? So, yeah, the, um, the, the, the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes lab, that started in uh, 2001 when I got my job at Sac State. I had just finished a, a postdoc at uh, UC Berkeley where I worked with George Barlow. And uh, George Barlow is a very famous uh, uh, animal behavior, uh, fish animal behavior person, ichthyologist. And he studied um, the Midas cichlid for most of his life, both in the lab and in the field. And I really liked that approach. And so I set up the Evolutionary Ecology of Fishes lab uh, with the idea that we would study mostly uh, fishes, mostly things about their evolutionary, evolutionary ecology, which is um, such things as the parental care, the reproduction, a little bit about uh, how they eat, foraging, predation, those, those sorts of things, other aspects of life history. And that's what we've mostly uh, focused on over the years. Um, I have had um, many, many students. Um, couldn't tell you exactly right now. The count is somewhere around 170, 180 undergraduate and graduate students that have worked with me over the years. Um, not all of them have worked with uh, with fishes. I've had students work on everything from uh, lichens, uh, plant things, and uh, to um, uh, amphibians, several students on amphibians. I've had a, a couple of students working on uh, mammals. In fact, one of my students right now works on a local mammal called the ringtail, 
which a lot of people are not familiar with. But it's a, it's a secretive local animal that people should know more about. It's, it's, it's an animal that's increasingly in, in trouble because we are dividing up its habitat and they don't cross highways very well. And that's actually what we're, we're interested in is how they are spread throughout the, the foothills and the Sierra Buttes and that sort of stuff. So we do things like that. And, and partly why I do things like that is because they connect to some of the same questions that we're interested in fishes in the wild. So I uh, do work in the wild in Costa Rica. Um, every year since uh, 1996, I've spent uh, three weeks to a month or so down in Costa Rica. This year's going to be interesting. We'll see what happens. Usually at the end of December. And we study, um, my students and I study uh, cichlid fishes there. So uh, in the lab, we well, in the wild, we can see things that go on. We can collect certain kinds of data, but mostly what we see is how these fishes actually work in the wild. And then we can bring those um, situations back into the lab and try and do interesting experiments uh, with the fishes, on, mostly on their parental care and their reproduction, to understand uh, what they do. And about how many tanks do you have in your lab? So yes, we have, uh, we have quite a few fish tanks in the lab in order to do all this work. Uh, right now there's about 170 uh, fish tanks, sometimes more, sometimes less. A lot of them are 20 gallon longs. That's probably my favorite uh, fish tank uh, for the lab. It's sort of a nice compromise between uh, not too small and uh, it's big enough that, that we can get things done and that we can get quite a number of tanks in the lab. All of them are uh, separate tanks. We don't have a, a flow through water system. So all of them uh, require individual uh, aquarium maintenance, much like you would do at home, you know, uh, siphon them out, clean the sponge filter, clean the glass, all that kind of stuff has to be done all the time. <laughs> so um, that's what we do. And um, we keep about right now there's about 65 species of cichlids in the lab so we have uh, a lot of uh, species we have only one tank full of them uh, sometimes just a couple of individuals and other times we have several tanks of them so that's uh, and so these uh, fish they're used in my experiments and in the experiments of of my students and so right now I have um, about eight master's students. Uh, of those, uh, just a couple of them are actually working on the cichlids. Other are working, others are working on projects uh, outside of the lab in the field on various things. And then I have, uh, it, it depends on the semester, but 10 to 15 undergraduates who are working with me on a few um, of these uh, mostly cichlid related projects. I'm sure you have a favorite. Which is your favorite fish? My favorite fish. Um, yes, I have. I would have to say I have two favorites. Um, the one favorite, uh, they're not the most colorful, uh, but they are definitely one of the most interesting when it comes to behavior, and that is the convict cichlid. Um, as people in the hobby are prone to say, if you get a pair of convict cichlids at the auction in, in a bag, uh, Sometimes they may have bred by the time you get them home. And that's one of the things I, I love about them is that they're very eager to breed and they are a great fish for uh, my particular situation, uh, which is to try and to, to introduce a lot of young people uh, into the ways, how do we do research, actual research. It, it's one thing to read about it, another thing to think about it, and yet something completely different to actually do it and uh, there's, there's a lot of practice involved and things never go right, but if you start with the convict cichlid, you will greatly improve your odds. So um, we have always a lot of convict cichlids in the lab and um, how we breed them, uh, we, we have a, a 20 gallon tank, uh, some gravel in there, uh, a flower pot, maybe three plastic plants, and uh, a male and a female. And the, the, the beautiful thing about convict cichlids is that um, I can take a student who has never even kept a fish before in their life. They have no experience with fish. 
and in many cases they are able to actually spawn the pair of convict cichlids within two weeks and they get to see the the the, the, the pair court their colors change they get to see that they get to see them uh, they don't always see them actually spawn because sometimes the fish spawn first thing in the morning or late in the evening or something like that or when the students are in class but they'll, the student will come in and there will be a bunch of fish eggs and uh, it's it's magical every time for the, the first time a student sees it a, a lot of times they don't even notice them the first time because as as people who, who have spawned uh, substrate spawning cichlids know these eggs are um, they're they're pretty transparent they're pretty hard to see and if you don't know what you're looking for you could easily miss them and of course um, the fish will sometimes play games they're supposed to lay these eggs in the flower pot at least that's what we tell them to do but sometimes they lay them on the glass or uh, they dig out a little hole and lay them on the the, the bottom of the glass or on the uh, the base of the plastic plants so they'll do other things and that's all part of the training of the students is to realize that you can plan all you want but these are alive animals and they're going to do what they're going to do so we attempt to direct them to do things that the way we would like but they do what they're going to do and then we have to deal with that and so um, we can then uh, do all sorts of interesting uh, experiments we'll talk about those a little bit later um, but the convict cichlid is fabulous and they're they're relatively inexpensive and you can usually get them at uh, pet stores you, you may have to look around but but they're usually there my other favorite um, my other favorite um, that would have to be a Central American cichlid called uh, Tomocicla tuba. Uh, tuba is a large fish, about yay big, that I have studied since 1989 in the rivers of northeastern uh, Costa Rica. It's, it's a rainforest fish, and um, I really just I really appreciate that fish. It lives in fast moving water, they lay very large eggs and a great parental care and the babies have this wonderful um, bumblebee stripe pattern and uh, they're just a, a wonderful fish to work with in the wild. You can get very close to observe them, I can videotape them, uh, all sorts of things like that. Now it is hard to work with them in the lab because first of all they're very hard to get although increasingly they are available um, but they do grow quite large and they really need moving water. This is not a fish that you would find in um, still water. This is a fish that lives in fast moving rivers and that's one of the things I like about them is their incredible uh, swimming ability and their ability to survive in this fast moving rainforest rivers. Can you tell me about some of your current projects that you're doing? Current projects, yes. We've got, uh, well, the, the things are constantly changing in the lab. As students come in, they do a project, uh, hopefully they complete it and then um, we, we transition to the next project. Some projects have been going on for a very, very long time. There's one project I've been doing for almost 20 years. Um, let's see, uh, I'll tell you about just a few of them, some of the, the interesting ones. I mean, we've got uh, from, uh, because we have a, a large number of, of species, one of my students, Lee, who's just graduated, was working on um, doing some molecular work uh, looking at their DNA to try and figure out the relationships between these um, uh, some of the Central American cichlids. And then on a finer level, uh, one of my graduate students, Sasha, has been working for several years on trying to understand the relationships amongst different populations of one particular uh, cichlid. And so we're, she's again using these molecular techniques to see if we can sort out uh, the, which, the fish in which river are more closely related to the fishes in other rivers. So that's an ongoing project. Uh, I'll tell you about one that just finished, uh, Colleen Moore. She just finished her master's with me. She graduated in the spring. And she did a, a really interesting uh, lab experiment on parental care in the convict cichlids. Now, um, Colleen had come uh, to Costa Rica with me and seen how these fish work in the wild, and that inspired her to design and carry out a really cool lab experiment. 
So what happens in the wild is you'll have a pair of convict cichlids. This is what we call biparental care. The two parents both take care of the kids. And we're, we're interested at, in the uh, parental care at the uh, fry phase here. So they've got free swimming fry. And so a pair of these convict cichlids will be in the river and they'll have their fry. And as the fry get uh, past the first swimming, they start to move around. In, in, they get up in the morning out of the nest and they start swimming around in the river and the parents basically follow them. You know, and on the first few days, the parents are probably hurting them more. And then after a while, it's more that the parents are just trying to keep up with this, this uh, school of, of little fry that is swimming around. Well, what will happen is you'll have one set of parents with their school of fry here, and you'll have maybe upstream about eight or 10 feet, another nest with another pair with their school of fry, and they're moving around and this pair is moving around and you can see it's it's like one of those inevitable something's going to happen here because they slowly move towards each other and then at some point the two schools run into each other and this is a, a, a moment of great drama uh, because there's potential for the babies to get mixed up with each other and there's a whole bunch of interesting research on that by Brian Wisenden um, but what we're really interested in is what do the parents do you've got one set of parents here and one set of parents here and they don't get along with the other one so they're going to attack each other and what Colleen was very interested in is which parent of this pair attaches attacks which parent of this pair and one of the uh, interesting things that we have others and, and we have noted over the years is that in these pairs the male is almost always um, a chunk bigger than the female. She's maybe he's maybe a couple of centimeters bigger than than the female. So if you know males about that big, females about that big. Same over here, male and female. And what she was very interested in is something we saw, and I have seen for many many years, is that when these two pairs come together, they're very picky about which parent attacks which other parent. And to uh, cut to the chase the big male always attacks, pretty much always attacks the other big male and the little female lines up with the other female. They, they choose their partners and they go at it. And if they're not arranged in a convenient way, they'll switch positions so that they can make it. So the big one attacks the big one and the little one attacks the little one. And now how she actually did this in the lab was really cool. She made a model we, we have used models for many years in my research where we make a picture of a fish on a stick and we threaten parents with babies in a fish tank and I also do this in the wild. Uh, well, she made a model that had two fish on it of different sizes and she would attack um, parents and babies in the lab with this and showed that they are in fact very, very particular about which parent attacks which parent. So that was just a really cool experiment, and we're just, just writing that up for publication now. Very, very cool work. Um, in terms of the undergraduate experience, I have uh, some students doing individual projects. I have uh, Haley is working on um, what happens to fish eggs when they get unusually cold, and it's surprising. So I'm just going to leave that there. It really surprised us what happens. So she is doing that project. That's, that's part of a summer research, fall research thing. And um, the bulk of my undergraduate students work on one big project called the Cichlid Fry Project. And the idea of this project is we're very interested in why there is so much variation in the egg size of uh, cichlids. They come from teeny, teeny, tiny ones to great big ones. Uh, the tiny ones are, are less than a millimeter in diameter, and the large ones are, for some of the species like the Trophius and some of the other uh, Lake Tanganyika species, the Frontosa, and some of the Cyprochromus, they're, you know, four millimeters in diameter. They're very, very large. So that's not just bigger in one dimension, that's bigger in three dimensions. So there's just a, a ton more material in one of those great big eggs. 
and with almost 2,000 species of cichlids, there is egg sizes spread throughout those extremes, which is fascinating to me. Why does one species make a little teeny tiny egg and another species makes a slightly bigger egg and so on, all the way up to these species that make these very large ones. Now, of course, as you can imagine, and anyone who has bred these fishes knows, if you uh, make a very large egg, you generally don't make very many. And this is one of the challenges of working with the, the large egg mouth brooders, is they may only have three or four or five eggs at once. Um, whereas one of the species that lays tiny eggs might have 300, even if the fish is, is not very large, so, or even more eggs than that. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of variation in egg size and there's trade-offs of this that uh, if you make big eggs, you don't get many. If you make little eggs, you get a lot. And so we are interested in, well, what are the advantages of different sized eggs a and the costs? We do experiments on all of this, but this current project is saying, what is one of the key advantages to making a bigger egg? What, what does the parent get out of it? And as you would imagine, Big eggs make big babies, big fry. And that's one of those things that's, that's relatively easy to say. It, it makes sense. But the way science works is that you can't just say it and believe it. You've got to prove it. And we have been uh, involved in the last five years in showing this uh, very, very precisely. Um, so how this works is um, we get a species of fish and we breed it, we get a sample of those eggs, which we preserve for measuring later, and we, we take only a portion of the eggs that are made. The rest, we allow the parents to raise them up, or we raise them up, depends on the situation. Uh, and this, these could be both uh, substrate spawners or mouth brooders. We raise them up until the point at which they are first swimming. And then we again take a sample, sample which we preserve, and then we measure all of these things very, very carefully under the microscope to a tenths of a millimeter, so very precisely. And what we have shown uh, with, um, it's taken almost five years now and about 55 different students have actually worked on this project. Uh, a lot of fish breeding. Um, the relationship is incredibly tight. What I mean by that is if you were to tell me the size of the egg I can tell you exactly how large that fry will be when it first swims. And so we started with um, the substrate spawners, the fish I'm most familiar with, the Central Americans, uh, the West African cichlids, uh, those kinds of fish, South American uh, substrate spawners. We started with those and we have a lot of data there. And then um, a couple of years ago, we branched out to to looking at the mouth brooders. And the question was, do the mouth brooders show the same relationship? And yes, the, the bigger mouth brooder eggs do make bigger fry, but is it, uh, the, the technical word is, is it the same slope? Is, is the relationship exactly the same slope? Are they, are they doing exactly the same thing? And my student, uh, Brianne Benitez, has been breeding mouth brooders uh, along with myself. And um, it's exactly the same relationship which is very interesting. That tells us that mouth brooding isn't really as different as what we might have thought. Uh, yes, the parent does have the babies in the mouth, but um, what it does for the egg, it doesn't do anything more or anything different than what a substrate spawner does. It just, mouth brooder fry are big because mouth brooder eggs are big. And where we've been uh, particularly able to test this is by breeding some of the substrate spawners that have the very largest eggs, and those would be species like the Steatocranus, the buffalo heads, have unusually large eggs for substrate spawners, and there's a few others. And then breeding some of the mouth brooders that have very small eggs for uh, mouth brooders, and those eggs are actually smaller than the eggs of the buffalo heads. So, and this, so we can see the clear uh, overlapping relationship. We're continuing on that. We, we, we need a, a, some more data on, on the mouth bitter eggs. 
Um, those are a little harder for us to work with. We're, we're not as familiar with the, the Malawi and the Tanganyikan mouth booters. So that's more of a learning curve for us. Um, one aspect that we've been getting into a lot lately is there is this other group of cichlids that are um, very intriguing. And that is the ones that lay the eggs on the substrate, but then pick them up and mouth brood them. And so we increasingly have been uh, accumulating these species in the lab. And as far as the data shows so far, they actually fall exactly where we would expect in the middle between these other two groups. So that's, uh, that's one of our, our main projects that keeps us busy, that keeps a lot of the fish tanks full. And a lot of the, the students are busy. Um, basically, they, they maintain their tanks, they watch their fish, uh, they try and catch when the fish spawns and uh, get those samples and then um, get the, uh, the, the fry when they first free swimming. And it doesn't always work. <laughs> okay, it doesn't always work. So for instance, um, I had discus many, many years ago and uh, I've always wanted to try them again, partly for this egg uh, project, but partly because of their parental care is so fascinating. And uh, thanks to Anthony Mazeral down at Soka University, I, uh, he managed to give me a couple of beautiful pairs of, of discus and uh, I've had them for, I guess, about a month now. And um, every day, it looks like it's going to be the day they spawn. And uh, yesterday was the day that uh, one of the pairs spawned, which was fantastic. But it turned out that the male didn't do his part and the eggs were not fertile. And so this is a big part of uh, lab science. It's a big part of aquarium keeping. It, it doesn't always work as as you have planned. And so the discus is an example of that. So we'll keep on it and hopefully uh, they'll spawn again in the near future and we'll get some, some fertile eggs. Um, we have a number of fish in the lab, which um, we, when we get them in and a student gets to work with them and they are able to spawn them in uh, sometimes a relatively short period of time. Many of these species I have spawned myself in the past, so I know little tricks like whether this species likes a, a flat piece of slate or, or a cave or a tunnel or something like that. Others are species I have never spawned. And so that's really wonderful for one of the students when they spawn a fish, which I have never spawned, and we learned something, you know, we didn't expect that to happen. And um, that's really cool. An example of that is the, the Steatocranus, the buffalo heads. Lots of hobbyists breed buffalo heads. They're not that tricky to spawn. But when you ask them, well, did you see the eggs? Almost no one ever sees the eggs of um, buffalo heads. They're rather secretive about how they spawn. They particularly seem to like to spawn in upside down coconut shells. I don't know if there's anything like the coconut where they're found in West Africa, but uh, they like these shells and they're quite secretive and yet when you do see the babies they're huge and that's because they really lay these very large eggs. Well there's a number of species in the lab which um, we've kept them for a while sometimes three four five years. Uh, some have never spawned. We've got some like that. Others um, spawn all the time but we never see the eggs. And an example of that would be Nanacara anomala, a little, wonderful little dwarf cichlid from, uh, from South America. Um, I have a tank full of them. The interesting thing is I didn't put a tank full of them. I didn't put that many in the tank. I put just a few in the tank, but there's a lot of them there now. And that's because they spawn and they raise their kids and we only ever see them when they've got little fry. I know uh, from previous work that they have very, very tiny eggs. And from other work, which I, I won't talk about today, uh, we know that those eggs hatch very quickly. Uh, at, at warm temperatures, it may even be in, in under two days. So um, they spawn in little caves. The eggs are very hard to see and they hatch very fast. And so as a consequence, we've never managed to get the sample of eggs to go with the fry. 
So with fish like that, we just we just keep working on it. Um, there's a bunch like that. There are a bunch of other ones like um, oh, just some of the things like the uh, the Nanochromus transvestitis, a beautiful West African cichlid, <clears throat> which we just haven't managed to spawn yet, but we're hopeful. People always ask me, what fish would you like to work with in the future? And uh, as I said, we're, we're getting more into some of the Tanganyikan uh, species, uh, some of the Malawi fish. Um, this is not my area of expertise. My expertise is, is uh, Central South America and uh, West Africans. And so um, we're, we're working on it. It's, it. There's a learning curve there. So uh, that, that is something that is... Uh, that is a challenge, and as I mentioned earlier, they don't have very many eggs, and so uh, this is one of the, the, the challenges that Brand, for, in, for instance, faces. If one of these um, species lays um, 10 eggs, and she's very, very good at getting the eggs out of the mouth, this is something that um, she hadn't done two years ago. She'd never kept a fish. Now she can get the eggs out of even the tiniest female in just a matter of seconds. She, she's learned how to do it very quickly, get the female back in the tank, no harm done. Uh, but we then have to decide what are we going to do if there's only 10 eggs, we need to preserve some of them so that we know how big the egg size was, but we need to keep a bunch of them to get them to hatch and then ultimately to become free swimming. So maybe we preserve two and then we try and raise up the other eight and we use these um, um, a hatchery devices. We've tried many different egg tumblers. These ones are cobalt ones we're particularly fond of. They don't actually make them anymore, but they allow us to control very well uh, what's going on in there. They're, they were, I guess, very expensive, which is why they maybe didn't catch on, but they do work very well and we can see exactly what's going on. And then we, we try and uh, get those eggs raised up to the, to the free swimming stage. So um, we would like to work with some of those. There are some sort of holy grail fish. There's the heterochromus multidens, which is a, a really cool um, a cichlid from West Africa, which it was never in the hobby, but has appeared in the hobby in the last uh, couple of years. They're really, really expensive. So we'll see, maybe in the future. And of course, you know, with almost 2,000 species, there's always another cichlid to, uh, to spawn. And what about the virus situation? How has that affected the lab? So the COVID-19 has been an interesting thing for us, as it has for everyone. Um, Fortunately, uh, as soon as this thing started happening in California, the governor issued a, um, a list of uh, essential services. And one of those uh, are personnel, people who take care of animals. And so I am authorized to uh, go to work every day and take care of the fish, uh, which I do. Um, of course, normally I would have, you know, 10, 15 students helping out, and that's really not been possible uh, during this crisis. Uh, we've had a little bit of help here and there, uh, but for a lot of it, it's basically me and the fish. And so uh, if you think it takes a bit of effort to take care of one tank or two tanks, um, try 170 of them <laughs> uh, while you're teaching courses, as I, as I am even now. I'm teaching two courses right now in the summer and so there's 170 fish tanks that need to be, uh, you know, fed and, and uh, maintained. And so if in some of the video that uh, is interwoven here, you see a little bit of dirt on the ground or um, some algae on the glass, that's why. Now, there's other reasons for that. Actually, I often leave algae in the tanks because the babies like to eat it. But, um, but maintenance is, is a challenge. We don't really know how this whole thing is going to play out. So... Um, we probably won't have a lot of the students back in the lab, uh, not in large numbers, for a while. We are, we are we are getting approval for a few students to work intermittently in the lab during the late summer and the fall. And so that will be good for them and, and to continue on with our projects. The fish, of course, they don't know anything about this. They are, 
they are busy doing what they do and uh, some of them are we've got them as very young individuals and they're just growing so this just allows them time to grow before they'll they'll breed so um, that's pretty much what's happening we'll see it's uh, it's unknown for us as it is for for everyone else what do you think is in the future for your lab what is the future of the lab that's that's a very good question uh, I intend to be uh, doing this for quite a few more years um, Anyone who's familiar with Sac State uh, will know that we, uh, we built a new science building, which is really cool, but it didn't have any space in it for the fish. We, we knew that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, I am in a very, very old building right now, and there are plans, um, sort of, uh, to move the fish lab to a newer building, not the new building, but a newer building. Um, this was all proceeding uh, at a certain pace until the coronavirus hit and now we're kind of uh, we're a little bit of a pause on that to see how that's going to uh, going to work out so uh, we don't know we'll see we'll see what happens do you have fish at home ah yes do I have fish at home <laughs> yes well Christy can attest to the fact that uh, even though I have 170 fish tanks at work that's not enough and uh, we have about 15 tanks at home and uh, every day Christy feeds them which is very nice uh, so she feeds the fish and they know her as the person who's going to feed them and so they respond very much to her uh, I have a number of different species there some of them are are much larger tanks than what I'm able to have at uh, work and I think right now probably one of my favorite tanks is the living room tank which is a uh, 155 gallon uh, bow front tank and in it I have um, Uwaru Fernanda Yepezi, uh, the beautiful Uwarus from South America and they started out as little guys about this big and there are nine of them and now they are getting on about that big and they are wonderful they are black and white uh, with some subtle yellows in their fins and they're 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 not adults but they're just getting on the edge of being young adults and we're really hoping to see uh, some of them spawn in the not too distant future thank you Ron I appreciate your time today thank you very much uh, for uh, interviewing me and I hope that uh, people from the Sacramento Aquarium Society uh, enjoy this and good luck with your fish keeping and stay safe